I've got my crayons right here, you know, on my desk. So it's uh, you know, just simple, so a simple person. Um, you gonna a take a bite of one of those for us? A little little <laughs> Uh, cocktails, and I thought I'd bring a snack with me. Welcome to Cocktails and Socktails, the podcast where we make cyber relevant to everyone and unlock the stories of our leading industry professionals. I'm Megan. And I'm Carly. On today's show, we're talking about how it's personal with Vishal Amin and the truly pivotal event that drew him into cybersecurity. Vishal is the general manager of security solutions for Microsoft Federal and a cybersecurity influencer in the industry. He's a Marine and former F-18 pilot, avid volunteer and advocate in the veteran space, California surfer, and a good friend. Welcome, Vishal. Oh, man, this is super fun. (laughs) Uh, So, Vishal, what are you drinking? Okay, I've got a... um, uh, it is five o'clock for us, so it's it's after hours. We're all good, and I've got a local um, Virgin Beer Company um, uh, hoppy IPA here called uh, Trivana here from Carlsbad, California. So it's, you know, keeping it local a little bit. So that's that's kind of what I've got. Take a little sip. Kick ass, Love it. Love Carly. It. What are you drinking? Uh, I'm drinking a Moon Margarita. What is? Uh, so it's a margarita, but we are in a full <laughs> moon water. cycle. Oh, okay. No, we're in a full moon cycle. So some people leave some water out and like create like moon water. I left my tequila out for moon margaritas. Okay, hippie. I'm I know, drinking. Not me. Uh, <laughs> I'm a right and one of these a margarita with only two ounces of tequila for a big shocking change in my life. I'm trying to cut back. Uh, yeah. So anyway. All right. Hello. Happy Friday. Let's get started. Yeah. Happy Cinco de Mayo. So Vishal, give us like the high level background of who you are, where you came from. You know, I gave a little snip, couple snippets in the intro, but like kind of where you started and how you got to where you are now. Oh, I know we can go super long, but I'll try to, I'll try to keep the snippets. Um, you know, I'm just... I, I, I'm just a Marine. I've got my, I've got my crayons right here, you know, on my desk. So it's, uh, you know, just simple, so a simple person. Um, you going to take a snack. bite of one of those for us? A little a little <laughs> uh, cocktails. And I thought I'd bring a snack with me today. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, it. It's a good uh, start here. No, it, it, it's funny. I've, I, you know, I, I always jokingly say I haven't been in this industry very long and um, it's true. I think our industry is changing very fast. We, you know, we have different folks in the industry. I personally, uh, I was an enlisted Marine back during the Clinton administration. I joined by mistake. I did all these things where, you know, and my father said, well, you made a commitment, go do it. So I, I went and did it um, begrudgingly. And I always say joining the Marine Corps is the best mistake I've ever made. I'm from a family of, um, you know, fairly accomplished individuals, right? Doctors, lawyers, dentists, who I say they're not doctors, but I mean, I guess they are in a way, right? So that, so I come from all these folks and I enlisted in the Marine Corps at 17. Um, I went into, you know, the, the military police community. There was no war. There was none of that. And I uh, ended up doing a couple of things with um, the Marine Corps as I enlisted and grew my career there. And then in 2004 or five timeframe, I commissioned um, and continued my career in the Marine Corps, ended up in the aviation community and F-18s. I ended up doing a lot of that stuff and flying around and um, pretending I was Tom Cruise and, and, and kind of having the time of my life there. <laughs> uh, I mean, cool side story, like that's, that's how I met my wife, right? Not, yeah. she, you know, she wasn't. She Not wasn't really. the instru- no she yeah she wasn't the instructor right driving around the car that I was chasing around in the movie she was my best friend and I married sisters so um you know we married sisters so now we're brothers in law which is kind of cool so every, every awesome. kind of fun yeah it was it was awesome and 
and it was awesome. I mean, it was a great, great life, great career. I mean, I, I, I was uh, in the Hornet community. We did a lot of ATARS missions, like a lot of data collection, South China Sea stuff uh, up in up in the Korea Peninsula, and then then down all over the Pacific. Uh, went into the Middle East as well. Uh, did a lot of data collection out there, and and served in Central Command, where I did a lot of that stuff as well. And what I mean that stuff is did a lot of air to, air to ground operations, or I was the uh, air officer. Um, and a subject matter expert for a couple weapon systems. So where we actually qualify the data, um, quantify the data and gave it back to the operators on the ground to actually conduct strikes and conduct missions all across uh, the, the region. And I think at that point in my life, I was at the apex of my career. I thought, man, it couldn't be, couldn't be better, right? I was um, in my 30s, I'd flown Hornets and, and been enlisted and I've married to this beautiful woman and i had um by that point we had two kids both of them uh born and you know i was out on deployment so you know meeting them later in their life which was which was tough and you know that's when you canceled your wedding to go on a deployment come back and get married you know all that stuff it was it was amazing so that was i mean i think that was the you know at that point in my career it was pretty amazing like what what i was able to be part of and i actually had no clue what i was doing in terms of the relevance of data it was more so the mission and i think i mean both of you i think are you know you understand that to an extent where a service member when they conduct a mission it's really about the people it's about national security and such broad statement but when i say national security i truly mean the safety and the long, long the, the safety and 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 the um and the actions of of us and and our partner nations and people that that really um, we are trying to we're trying to protect our way of life, and and just being part of that was amazing. Uh, from there, though, I went and went but got back in the cockpit and I got to do some air operations again in the Hornet, um, and then I went onto the ground. I went to a Marine Expeditionary Unit and I went afloat. I went on a boat and and um, went to Joint Special Operations Command later. And I was an air officer and I used to call in airstrikes and go jump in Ospreys and go do different things with the same data that we were collecting, qualifying, and now I was on the ground. So it's this like data centric breadcrumb trail that made made its way all the way through my career. And um, I think for, for me, well, I don't, I don't think, it did, March 21st of 2015, that's when my, my world got rocked. It's, uh, you know, I, I found out I was on the Islamic State's uh, top 100 people to be killed list. And it was published all over uh, the media, all over the web, all over the, you know, on the line, you know, it was everywhere. And, uh, and, and, you know, it was coming up 19 years in the service at that point, coming up at the tail end of my career. And my plan was to stay in longer. But, you know, that was the moment where the, the, the physical safety of me, my, my, my family, my, my, my kids, my home was compromised. Um, I mean, imagine finding that out via phone call, getting 100 phone calls on your way home, and then your home getting cleared like it's a narcotics lab, um, and then having to live in it, knowing that everyone knows what you look like, everyone has your address, everyone ha knows how to contact you, and then leaving the home, leaving your family there, and finding you know your family shaken and, and trembling because there's people in the windows with you know with weapons not knowing if it's law enforcement not knowing if it's a terrorist or or whatever it is or whoever it was so we couldn't live there so we lost our i say we lost our home but we we elected to leave the home and you know we had to disclose the fact that the home was was um was targeted and you know our life savings into this dream home went away and you know we kind of lived a different life and I chose to um, get out of the Marine Corps shortly after and dedicate my life to cybersecurity or data. And that's when I got into the industry. I mean, I it wasn't an easy just get into the industry. I mean, no, you know, I, I wasn't sharing this publicly at the time. It wasn't until um, year to, like two years later, I believe. And then, and I mean, imagine trying to get out with that, with that much time in the military and all you've done was be in airplanes, you know, be on ships, you know, you wore the same onesie to work every day. And then your career ended, you know, by that event. And 
instead of national security, your number one goal was let me go turn on my car in the morning before I put my kids in it. Right. Let me go drive to work a different way. Let me go, um, you know, live away from the family for a little bit to, to, to differentiate how we do things in our home. I mean, it was a different, different life. And, uh, and that's kind of when I got into our industry. So, I mean, and, you know, you asked how did I get to where we are today? I mean, there was a lot from that moment to now and and how we look at security, how we look at data and innovation that led me to what I do now. But I think, you know, we can dig into however much of this as you want, but, but the reason I ended up where we are, where I am today is because there was someone in the industry that thought differently about how we should look at cyber, how we should look at innovation and how we should implement that back into the sector and not just the defense sector where I have I have the the privilege to work with now, but the cyber industry in general. Right. I mean, you have to think differently. And I mean, I you know, teaching yourself. Teaching yourself how to code, even though you don't know how to do it, and it's just like totally sucking at it. Um, and then, and now we have things like ChatGPT and other things where you can just have something code for you. Um, I mean, if if in 2015, 16, we had what we had today, like my, I think my on-ramp would have been a lot faster, but there's been a lot since then in innovation that's allowed me to see the power of data and mission and invest back into the community. And I think that's how I got to where I am. See, now you got me on this long rant. I know, but I love it. Yeah, that's good. So no, I want to know if there was, when you got out, did you kind of know based on your experience being in service and kind of following the, connecting the dots from the data, so to speak, as you alluded to, did you know you wanted to go into IT and data security? Was that a given or did you have like a, a turning point or something that you were like, you know what, no, I'd yeah. kind of like to pursue this? I, I'll be honest with you. I, I think a lot of, I share this a lot with veterans getting out into the space and defense and individuals getting out of the space. And I always say, be passionate about what you want to do, right? Um, invest in what you're passionate about. But I'm, I'll be the first to say I was the, I'm the, you know, I was the first to, to not do that. It's a very hypocritical statement, and it's a very, it's a Monday morning quarterback statement because when I got out, it wasn't about investing in IT. It was literally about paying the mortgage. Mm. So whatever I needed to do to get that done, that's what I did. And then I further invested in my career that way. And I fell into data, I fell into IT, and I kind of had this vision of this is where the industry is going. This is what we're going to do, you know. Yeah, I think that's, you know, kind of what you said there is very relevant, especially in a sense for transitioning veterans or really anybody because there's a lot of leadership seminars or whatever that you go to and they're like you know work in what you're passionate about and that's not always feasible because we've got bills to pay mouths to feed and so sometimes it's you know paint like finding a job doing the job and then like using that to either like do your passion in the off time or then feeding into going into what you're passionate about later, you know, and I think that's like the reality of the passion game that people don't talk, talk about when talking about career development and career advancement or transitioning. So I think that's a really, you know, really honest response. I mean, I got some great advice yeah. from, from, a, from a, a mentor of mine and he's, he's an amazing individual. Um, he actually works for, you know, I mean, he's he was never in our industry, but now he is in our industry and not 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 at Microsoft, but somewhere else. So, you know, um, another very large organization that's just as big and in some fast larger than us. But he he told me one thing when I got it. He's like, you know, everyone's worried about three things where they're going to live, how much money they're going to make and what you know, what they need to do to make those two things happen. Um, mm. And there was and there's some truth to that. Right. But I think one thing that you can add into that is you have to take a chance so that you don't have to, you don't reset again later. And also when you go in, go all in, right. Go, go put everything to that, to that goal. So especially when it came to it, 
in technology, when I got in, it was all about voice and um, an endpoint was 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 there, but we were really talking about the network and 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 data center resiliency and doing a lot of DR um, and that type of work. So you know, we saw I saw a lot of movement in organizations like Cisco mm -hmm. and VMware and Palo Alto Networks and their integrations with you know uh, large large uh, data organizations like Splunk and those were like they were they were they were rising the ocean for us and that's that's where the industry was so just that's where i was learning i was like what are what are what are they all doing how are they all connected and even at that time everyone was like an ancillary like product everyone was an ancillary service and all i could think about was like which one of these organizations is going to give me the most amount of learning about where our industry is going what they're going to do and where do i invest my time and I ended up at an organization where I worked with all of them and then kind of had to teach myself what each of those organizations did and what their mission was and what their goals were. And when I transitioned from that, it was someone saying, hey, Vishal, this is where I feel the industry is going. There's this thing called the cloud. And you've been working with all this on all these on premises firewall, like all these physical firewalls and all this on premises um, infrastructure. We think that everything is going to shift this way. And this is what Microsoft is doing. This is what the industry is doing. They're building in this thing called Azure. And at that moment, I was only two years out from the Marine Corps. Imagine, right? I mean, I'm, it's all the self learning happening. And all I knew about that was Microsoft 365, right? The SaaS platform. And that's what I thought cybersecurity was in a way, right? <laughs> And I was like, well, we have we have these, you know, Cisco ASAs, we've got like you know, Palo Alto traps for endpoint, we got all these things. And then I was like, well, and then we got Microsoft 365 that does that has like its CASB and it has this identity solution and it has all this stuff. And I said, This is this is great. Now, how does it tie together? And then I started seeing things start to tie together and start expanding. And and that's when your learning starts kicking in. And the reason I bring all this up is because it was in that moment, I think it was probably like five years ago where I just started seeing the industry just start like setting on fire, right? It just started ramping up. And someone that was not from the industry, if I could see it as a mission operator mm -hmm. and then say, this is what this is what its effects going to be on industry, on all this stuff that's happening, um, there's something to do here. So I go back to your original statement is like, someone took a chance on me and told me this is what I believe is going to happen. And I kind of jumped in their boat with them right and try to learn as much as i could and i stayed in the boat and i stayed in the boat and i stayed in the boat and you know by luck the boat ended up you know in the right spot so awesome. um vishal what was your first job out of service you mentioned that you had a little bit of a gap we spoke um before we started the uh, kicked off the show you mentioned that oh, you had man. a gap and I mean, it's I first, yeah it was my first job out of service was <laughs> was um the unemployment check I got from the state of California, you know, that was, that was it. I actually wanted a job so bad in tech that I cold called thousands of people just to understand <laughs> what they did. And I ended up getting like 300 people to schedule meetings with me. So every day I was scheduling meetings with folks, just learning about their jobs from HR to partner, to channel, to, to sales, to engineering. Um, and I ended up, I ended up landing this, this job for an organization called um, Dimension Data, which was, which acquired a company called, uh, called, called um, uh, Nexus IS, and now is an NTT organization, which is you know a global a global technology company, and they didn't have any business in the Southwest U.S. for public sector, and they said, well, come come build this out here, and I had a manager saying, hey, I'm already working with one customer, come come like manage how we're gonna do this. And I took a $45,000 a year job. Imagine like 20 years in the Marine Corps, I took a $45,000 a year job. And while I was doing that, I applied for jobs at like Starbucks and all the local places around me. I mean, it took a took a little bit of a humble pill to swallow, right? Like like that much, that long in the Marine Corps, you're not collecting any benefits because of what happened at the at the time. And, uh, and mm -hmm. you just had to put food on the table. So it was taking that job and then finding side jobs and, and like learning what consulting was a little bit and saying, well, how do you put food on the table? 
you know. So I didn't realize that we had this in common, but I moved to Northern Virginia in 2012. I was like fresh out of a, an abusive relationship with a, a guy. I won't go into details, um, but I needed a fresh start and I moved out here and I have two degrees in the hospitality industry and I was running nightclubs back home. I had 15 years experience in food and beverage and had actually owned my own business. And it was, I had to take a big old helping a humble sauce because I couldn't get an interview at Starbucks. I mean, I couldn't get a job. Uh, my brother actually had to call in a favor and got me a job doing basically glorified help desk at, I won't name the company, but making 30 grand a year, I had to figure out how to commute from basically down south of Quantico into Arlington oh, yeah. for chump change. Um, and I did, I was a waitress at Buffalo Wild Wings for a long time before I got that first job. And and I bring all this up because everything you're saying is resonates is is resonating so hard with me. Like humble sauce, humble pill, um, taking a job that you feel is like very below your kind of means or self worth, just having to put food on the table, so to speak, um, and then having to train yourself up. Like I know that having aspirationally, I know I want a better life for myself. I know that I'm not at the pinnacle. This is just the, the entry point, and having to do whatever you have to do, like grinding on your own time to get to that next step. I didn't, I didn't realize we had all this in common, but that of course I didn't have a 20, 21 year Marine, uh, career. So that's, that's a, a big one up you got on me, but <laughs> I don't know if it's a big one up more. So just, you know, I think there was a lot of like security blanket in that, like you're in the mm-hmm. industry, you kind of know that thing you've invested. You think like when you go, when you go to college, this is what I want to do. I want to go in IT. I want to go into, I mean, there's sales degrees now, right? There's engineering degrees, and that's literally what you do. I was a political science major with a C-minus average at the state school. You know, like, I mean, that that was me. I, my, my, my pedigree was not, not glamorous at all. But I think it's testament to where we are going in the world. Like, if you want, again, the same individual who, who I look up to so much here um, at Microsoft, she said, if you want to solve the biggest challenges in the world, you have to think about things differently, right? You can't just engineer your way into the solution. Um, so you have to think about things from the level of the people that are there and the people that are in industry now, whether it's hospitality, whether it's in tech. I mean, even Satya says every organization in the world now is a technology company, right? So like put yourself in their shoes like that. That barista at Starbucks, that, that hostess at Buffalo Wild Wings, um, that Lieutenant Colonel, you know, um, flying in a Hornet or the, or, or I don't know, I mean, anyone in any industry, they are, they are the key to what we do and how we do it. Right. And our goal isn't to develop the tech, it's to achieve what they need to achieve. And right now, technology is kind of the medium. And if we can look at it from a different angle, it helps us attach it there. So there's a lot of learning that continues to happen. I mean, I, you know, surround yourself with people that think differently and that work hard and really believe in what they're doing. And it's a lot better than su- surrounding yourself with, you know, a pedigree of just individuals that are, you know, very, very esteemed or very, very educated for lack of better terms. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I think it's, I think it's a key diversity is a key component of how we keep moving things forward. All right. You mentioned if you want to solve the world's greatest problems and having to think differently. So I'm going to touch on, I don't know if it's the world's greatest problem, but I certainly think it could be one of the world's greatest solutions. How is AI going to change the tech field? Took oh. my question right out of my mouth. Oh, Dang sorry. It. Cause there are no time <laughs> sinking. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. It's good. I just had, um, a lot of great conversations around AI the last couple of days, actually. Did you, hey, he was gonna, I thought he was gonna be like, hang on, let me ask Chat GPT the answer to that question. Oh, I know, I've got it up right here, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't send you any prep questions. I've got my Chat GPT right here, and I've got, um, I actually use, I, I, you know, the, the AI infused into Bing, I use that now, yeah. um, which is kind of nice. So, traditionally, I would say folks will say AI, you know, AI is not a search engine. Right. You don't just go on Google search or Bing and you say, tell me this or tell me that AI is not a search engine. So when you when you think of, um, um, you know, the 
when you think of the algorithms and, and everything that runs the, the AI or the machine learning, you're thinking about data and how it's parsed and how it's fused together to empower you to make the best decisions or empower you to take action. Um, so when we talk about AI in general, let's say IT, let's, let's just bring cybersecurity as a topic. Right now, a lot of the conversations are how we're we using ML and, cyber, and AI to solve for cybersecurity um, challenges. And that's, you know, at Microsoft, we have our 65 trillion signals a day, threat signals a day that we see. Um, you have a SOC made up of folks that haven't been in a SOC for years, and, you know, they may have only been done it one or, one or two times. We have these solutions that we're building in, like Copilot, where you can, you can, you can speak to individuals and, and, and validate things and run things by each other, utilizing um, Copilot, which is infused with AI now. That's how we're filling holes. Right. That's how we're filling jobs. That's how we're filling uh, the the lack of three three point two billion jobs or three three million jobs that uh, million jobs that are that are that are open in IT. I think I've got the stat wrong, but it's something around that. And I would say that's that's a reaction to what AI can do now. Right. Mm -hmm. What we should think about is you know the conversations I had was AI is going to make my kids lazy. It's gonna make them not write papers. It's not gonna, it's gonna make them do X, Y, Z. The example I give here though is I have three young kids and they love games and they love their iPads and they love that kind of stuff. And I used to say, well, watching your iPad, your brain's gonna go to mush, right? You're you're not gonna learn a lot. But I can tell you that though I still believe portions of being on screen as is not good, you know, I want them out and about. They are a lot more, um, uh, they're, they're a lot more able to do things, you know, on their technology that I feel like was my strength, right? I mean, the way they mm -hmm. multitask and move things and, 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 and do 18 different things at once and are able to like backdoor maybe an application to get into because I didn't approve it, right? At the age of eight, right? Like, like I could think their brains are mush, but it's forcing their brains to think four, five, six steps ahead. And I would challenge everyone, when you look at AI, don't look at it what, how it's gonna solve your current issues and how it's gonna solve. What is truly a next generation SOC? What is, what is cybersecurity next generation? What are you actually learning? Are you learning how to utilize the AI or are you learning the algorithms that the AI is built off of and how those algorithms are structured and what, what's going to change there and how that's going to be infused in other things. You have to up level and look forward to what you're actually looking at. There was, um, there was, a, there was an organization that I, I spoke to two weeks, I'll say their name, Flawless AI. And, um, you know, they took, they took uh, uh, the movie industry and 2D, 2D, you know, um, facial imagery and all of that. And this is all on their site, on the on the public site, so that you can you can look at it. And they essentially took it and they said, well, it costs us millions of dollars. I've sh well, I'm sure it's cost a million of dollars to redo a scene. What if not just dub it over, but what if you could make it so that you can redo it without calling the actor back? their voice, their dialect in a different language, moving different things. Like, I mean, these are real use cases of AI that are going to save money, that are going to save time, but also challenge us with a new set of, of not problems, but obstacles that we're going to have to overcome. So it's going to force us to think differently. It's going to force us to think ahead, right? When we start talking facial recognition and we start we start talking about like you know your your genetic breadcrumb that 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 you're utilizing to access technology this is going to force us to do things differently um so i think ai is not the future but it is now mm -hmm. um you know and we have to think about it as an innovation rather than something that we're just using to to solve a problem right it's not just ai is going to help us Solve goals. There's there's another great example. Someone mentioned to me yesterday. They said, "Hey, we've got we've got these underserved populations across the U.S. and and um, economic areas that you know it is hard to come out of." And because someone 
that enlisted in the Marine Corps and I was a first generation American. My, my grandfather, would, my grandfather, I didn't know it till like, I think a year or two ago, he was a cotton picker. Um, so very, you know, very salt of the earth, blue collar type of individual. Uh, how do you get folks from these demographics of individ, uh, of communities into higher paying jobs where they could take care of their families and do things that they've never been able to and give them access to schools and all of that? Someone will say, well, they'll just use AI to do the papers. And, I'll, and I, I'll, I'll argue even more so, instead of learning how to code, that now becomes a given and they can learn the algorithms. They can learn how it's being infused. And now they can use the technology to do jobs that pay six, six figure 10 times faster and bring themselves out of these communities to, to benefit their families and themselves. That is the future. That's what AI should be doing. And that's what it is probably already going to do. Right. So like I'm wearing this shirt ironically, like it's gonna, it's gonna it, you have to use technology to do more good. Right. Like cybersecurity is not about securing people, it's about enabling people. Mm. And I think AI should be the same thing. That's a, such a good point. You were saying that, and I was thinking about like Carly and I had this conversation the other day about like, you know, in school they were saying you have to learn long form geometry because or long form uh division because you're not gonna be able to just walk around with a calculator in your pocket. We all do. Are, are you sure? Um, and about how, okay, now we're going to start like cheating and saying, oh, well, AI is going to like write my papers, et cetera. But it's like, what if we think beyond that instead of like the, you know, well, what if, what if it's going to create these problems? What if we think in terms of what if AI could like bring education to students in like underserved parts of the world who don't have access to, you know, like learning to code and things like this, like really your advanced uh education that wouldn't be available to some underserved communities and it's like now you have the ability to generate courses not out of thin air so to speak but more or less and uh offer them up to kids who would otherwise never have access to these types of technologies and learning opportunities imagine, imagine if you're reading like that was so what was that where it took you eight hours to read you know you know a small book but you can utilize things like chat gpt to give you the summary so that when you go to that group of peers, you could, you could have that discussion, right? right? Yeah. To help you level up, right? I mean, I, I took reading lessons through uh, fifth grade, sixth grade, because I was just a horrible reader, physical reading lessons, but it wasn't, you know, I realized I wasn't, I wasn't failing because I couldn't read well. It was my comprehension. It was, I was so focused on the words. Mm -hmm. I wasn't learning those things. What if I could save that time and work on the latter? You know, and I look yeah. at cybersecurity the same way. Um, we use things like Azure and our, you know, our multi-cloud partners to scale these types of technologies so that we can do more, right? Not, not to just make money, not to, not to help the shareholders, but how do we empower the soldier, the Marine, the warfighter to, to ensure that they're accomplishing their mission in the safest way possible so they could come home without fear of death, injury, bodily harm, and go to, like my daughter has ballet today, go to her ballet practice or gymnastics practice at the end of the day, right? I mean, that's where I want to be. And, I, you know, like, let's utilize AI and machine learning to do more of that. And I think when we talk about where is AI and cyber, mm -hmm. That's where it is. Like, stop thinking about protecting, protecting, mitigating, protecting, mitigating. Think about how you're going to utilize it to do more good, right? And then use everything that we're already doing and see how we can like put that into a platform and standardize all of that, you know, and 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 mitigate all the, you know, stuff around it. Well, and if you think about like with AI and like you know, kind of what you were talking about with you know, if you were reading a book, you know, in elementary school and your focus on the words of the comprehension is not there. Like there's so many people where either English as a second language or if they have dyslexia or some other type of neurodivergency where AI can help them stay on track with their peers and not feel other, you know? Um, and I mean, similarly, like with the screen time thing, like brains turn to mush, but it's like, what are they doing on that screen time? And I was very like, you know, in a sense, sometimes would think in that old school, like mentality, like, you know, go out and play, but there's a lot of things like that are good on the screen. And that's where we are today. Like kids don't get five books 
for their course load. They get a Chromebook or they get a computer and all of the material is on that computer, their textbooks included. So it's it's the quality of the time, not just necessarily mm-hmm. like the time. Because I know like I've been spending a lot more time like doing Duolingo has been my like new recent obsession. But there's an AI function, which is great because I can have a conversation without having to find somebody who's fluent in French who could like try and talk to me a little bit, you know? That's a great point. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity and we've talked about a lot of the opportunity and you know how AI is not super scary, sure. but what problems could AI create or what yeah. potential exploitations? Cause everything is always created in, with good in mind, and then there's always somebody out there. Yeah, but who, our threat actors are like looking for. There's them. always somebody it, out right? there who is it. trying to like ruin a good thing, you know. They're already doing it. So. I mean, you can't just shut this off. Yeah. Right. When I was put on, when I was put on that ISIS kill list, it wasn't. You could, I couldn't just take my name off of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I don't want to be on this list anymore. Please right. me. Kind of like AI. <laughs> yeah, you can't just say, hey, we can't use it. That's just my opinion. You, you, we have to we have to regulate it. How do you regulate something? At, you know, I, I call it like, yeah, I think, well, I don't call it, I've, I've read it. You know, the efficacy in using AI um, is an important topic. Uh, what what What's going to happen? Like, I, I don't see AI as something that is going to overcome us, but more so start, um, you know, we're going to start seeing more and more things around like deep fake, right? That's, that's really Mm -hmm. where I see, you know, nations, nation state threat actors kind of investing in AI. Um, Mm -hmm. When I work from home, so I don't know if you can hear the street cleaner behind me right now that just went through there. You work from home? That's not your office with the, uh, the rack and all the surfboards? (laughs) Oh man, you had my, me. I, I thought, that, my garage. thought that was yeah. your office. I thought that was this is my, this Microsoft is my SoCal. <laughs> this is this is yeah, this is the Microsoft budget office. cuts, right? Oh, yeah, office in the garage. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, th- that's a whole different topic, right? Of of you know, I think embracing people where where they are and who they are. It shouldn't matter what they do to to get whatever job it is done. But to to your point, um, I think deep fake and and those types of initiatives are things that we should be looking at, right? Mm-hmm. And then if you tie in quantum, right, and the advancements of quantum and where that's going, and then infusing that with AI, right, what does that get us? Like, where where does, what industries are going to be affected by that? And don't think about the technology, but think about the processes, right, of all the contracts that you've ever signed to buy a home. So what does that mean? For ownership, what does that mean for intellectual property? What does that mean for longevity of where your family's at, or what your tra- what your what your retirement goals are, and then what your family's health and safety goals are, or medical records like, um, you know, the EMR pieces with with the big organizations like Cerner and Epic, right? These are the types of things they're thinking about. Um, but AI and the malicious use of AI has a lot to do with that, right? And I think that's that's where we have to look at critical infrastructure or, or critical mm-hmm. industries that affect human life, human longevity, um, quality of life. That's that's the stuff that we need to be looking at, not just is AI going to break X, Y, Z? Am I not going to be able to log in my email and access my data, right? Um, tie that data to a human action that that people value. And I think that's where that's where our nation's actors are already going, and that's where they're going to go. Um, you know, one of the trends that I've seen that I don't think we people have spoken about too much that I truly feel is a big deal is look at every organization in the world and look at their physical security element, right? Getting into doors, getting into buildings, booking a conference room, access, physical access. Mm-hmm. Now look at their um their uh, information technology department in most organizations they don't really talk to each other right in terms of mitigating physical threat utilizing um risk with signals and the technology but now 
the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning and then people understanding where you are and connect, connecting it to the human, I think the risk moves back to the person more. And I really see AI revolutionizing this wave of going back in person, going doing things um, in a very physical sense, right? I could see teachers at schools requiring people to come back to the classrooms and hand write things. I could see um, oh, yeah. I could see people I could see people utilizing AI um, to to find signals and intelligence to you know for workplace violence as well. So you're gonna have to actually work with your physical security teams more. So individuals that usually you know don't that do the physical security scanners and the metal detectors, you know, they're gonna have to start tying in all these signals and all these advancements together. And it, it, what what I'm saying here is the technology is gonna go back to the human. Right, it's this cycle, and I think I I firm I truly believe that's the next thing. Right, um, AI is not just going to advance how we do things, but it's gonna, it's also going to force us to humanize how we do things. So, all right, you're bringing it kind of full circle for me here, because I my like constant thing that I bring up, I talk to customers about it, is that human beings are kind of officially our weakest link in the chain. They always have been, and it's never been more true now as our technology is becoming more advanced. And um, so with that, my question is, and I don't mean this in a like sarcastic way, but how quickly is the human brain and the human experience going to become obsolete in the face of AI? I don't think it will ever be obsolete because human decision making is also in one way shape or form have an element of emotion to it and i think that's what differentiates data and the actions that we take um is emotion right I, when when our country was founded it wasn't founded because you have this much land we have this much land so we deserve this much land it was that emotion of of that that was generated through conflict and resolution and and what they felt was right, what, what they felt was wrong. Even in the world today now, when you look at our sector, people are aligning to the East and people are aligning to the West. And a lot of our physical supply chain is reliant on the East, right? And a lot of our, a lot of our uh, software supply chain, we can start moving in other directions, right? Um, but the leaders of these nations are people. And you're never gonna be able to differentiate, you're never, True emotion can, you know, cannot be replicated. Like AI is not going to give you, like, the 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 bot is not going to get goosebumps, right? Mm -hmm. It's always going to be data driven. Uh, so, but I think we have to have some type of risk scale where we mm -hmm. can assume risk at a certain level. We know, like, at what like there has to be a lot of self-regulation, right? At what yeah. at what level am I going to make this data available to make a decision? And at what level, like, is it like, this is my gut, this is what I feel? Because there's a, there's a character strength that I speak about often with another organization, and it's called social intelligence. And social intelligence has nothing, you know, has nothing to do with making data-driven decisions it has to do with emotion. It has to do with interaction. It has to be, do with situational awareness. Um, and social intelligence is a large component of how people make decisions and how you, you know, you look at marketing and you look at, you look at our sector of, 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 of adopting technology. So um, I probably went around your question a little bit, but that's, you know, I think emotion for me would be the, the answer. Like you, you can't replace that. And and you could try. You can do all these things. You can you can use data data. Like I mean, I'll be vulnerable. Like look at the look at the um, the pullout of Afghanistan years ago, right? Mm -hmm. In my mind, and listen, I'm I'm not read in to to all of it, and, and any of it. But I know through the community that I'm part of, and and some of the things that I uh, the communities that I'm part of that went over there as well to to go do some of the work. That that decision was a data driven decision but there was a lot of emotion and a lot of cultural pieces that we didn't account for that that made it so that it was not a clean it was it was it was not a clean extract or it was not a clean um, series of events for us um so 
it could be the right decision on paper, but it could also yeah. control people. And the history books will remember, fortunately or unfortunately, where wherever you fall politically with this, the history books will remember the emotional impact of that far greater than the success or lack thereof or whatever that was data driven and on paper. On paper, you're going to see how many people were in that C-17 or whatever aircraft it was that was flying out. On mm -hmm. picture, you're going to see the people hanging off the landing gear as the plane was taking So out. poignant. I just got goosebumps when you said that. That is like such a good way of positioning that. No, and I always like speak to like the, you know, when people talk about automated aircraft or, you know, the with drones that are doing work of what planes were doing and then you know they're coming out with more and more automation within the helicopters you know i'm like that's great but the person behind the screen isn't seeing truly like real time like close proximity what's happening on the ground and so those decisions that are being made even with automation you're you might not see the same level of efficacy but um so I, and you I and, and when you that's fight a great the, differentiator, the emotion versus data driven. When you fight nation state actors, and especially within, you know, especially within your organizations, um, the the I, th I think where I was going with this was when you when you do that. Oh, when you when you do that, you're not combating against data. You're you know these are individuals mm -hmm. that can care less about efficacy, and and they're gonna come at you with at all angles, right? Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that holds us up in many instances is the way we govern our processes and how quickly we adopt our technologies and our processes to protect ourselves against it. And those are guardrails, right? We're doing that to keep ourselves safe and to do things with in, in the right mindset um, so that we're not cowboys in, 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 a, in a sense where we're not doing things in the wild west where there was there was no rules or, or governance or laws um we're trying to stay within the boundaries to hold ourselves accountable but that says that doesn't mean it's a bad thing it just it means that we have to focus on other things like how fast mm -hmm. can we set these expectations how fast can we adopt these technologies right funding where does funding need to go so that we can we can move these things out faster so that we can we can we can protect ourselves from the nation state act, bad actors that are out there um so we can be we can do the right thing and someone you know we can fight that war face to face and the other person can come around us we just have to be able to get that data faster and be able to move before that guy comes around or that girl or that gal or or, or that actor or whoever it is comes around and gets you yeah. um we have to enable other things. And like when I look at the federal government side of the house, the business that I get the privilege to, to work with, I look at the direction that we're going now. So there's a lot of a lot of uh, executive orders that are out right now on cybersecurity. There was, you know, for me, like the most relevant one last year, like M2131, right? When that started, um, understanding the importance of data, how we store the data, where it is, mm -hmm. Um, how long you have to keep it so you have access to it and then we have to start leading in on funding like who's going to enable all of that right what contract vehicles can we put all of this stuff on what and then you have a private sector entity of like well you can we can we can enable all of this um but we also have a responsibility to our shareholders and our people right um so there's there's all these dynamics we have to play but i think as as an as a as a nation that invests in innovation technology we're just going to have to do it faster and we're going to have mm -hmm. to do it better than everyone else. Right. And we're just going to have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. I know it's Fast. very difficult for you to uh, detach professional Vishal from personal Vishal because it's very much the one and the same person. We've talked about what you're doing professionally. I would really want to pivot and talk about kind of what you're doing in your personal life. Yeah, so we talked about, and you kind of mentioned, and you kind of really teed us up for this next uh, question with talking about social intelligence. And, you know, you do a lot of work in the veteran space, um, in addition to what you do in the cyber space. So can you talk to us about some of the things that you do in the veteran support space? 
what you do now that you are that veteran. I know once a Marine, always a Marine, but you don't put the uniform on every day, but you do do a lot to still serve that community. So, I mean, I, I've, I've, I just love the space where you can feel like you have your bucket full again. I mean, I, I'd love to differentiate the fact that, yeah, I got my start in the nonprofit side on the veteran side, but um, it's really not about the veterans. I, you know, I look at, I know you wanted me to detach my professional and personal, but let me give you an example. Like when I, when I first had, when I, the first time I had the opportunity to start hiring a team and, uh, and building a business um, at Microsoft, imagine putting a job application out uh, and saying, hey, I need a cybersecurity or a security specialist or a technical specialist for the Department of Defense. Like think about all the applications, the people that apply, right, from all across the industry. And as someone that's very empathetic to that trans, especially through my journey and how hard it was to learn things and, and, and get to where you need to get to, not because of career growth, but because you, you just feel like it's the, the right thing to do at the right time. Um, you want to give that opportunity to people. And I also say like what I, one of the things I learned is meeting so many people not in a veteran space. 21 years, I learned that perseverance, courage, even love for learning, all that stuff was was baseline in veterans. But there was millions of stories out there of those same strengths that came from families that had nothing to do with military connected communities, which was so Mm -hmm. awesome, right? Because at the core of it, they're trying to take care of themselves and their families and doing it for the right reasons. And they've invested their lives and what they do in into the efforts to get to where they want to get to. So what I do in the outside of our space is I, mean, I tie it a lot to what I do now. But there's organizations like the Travis Manning Foundation where it is veteran based, but their goal and their mission is to empower um, the youth of our nation to live their lives with character. It doesn't have to be a veteran, right? right. Uh, there's there's all types of other organizations that I mean anyone you know in our in in our business at Microsoft Federal for Security, every, you know, every month we try to the best of our ability to bring a nonprofit in to learn about them and why they do it. And it's not a veteran space. Like, I think we have to invest in service um, to, to get ourselves whole, right? Like, there has to be some sense of selflessness. There has to be some sense of service and serving in other capacities. I surround myself with so many opportunities, more than I can probably handle, but I almost need it, right? Because just working and 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 doing what I love here isn't enough. I, it has to be tied to doing something greater, impacting the community, maybe maybe connectivity for people around the world, maybe empowering students to live their lives with character with and learning what love and perseverance and, and things like that actually mean. Um, uh, on the veteran side specifically, like sharing with veterans your experiences and then investing and teaching them how to gain, you know, the networks and the goals that they want to get to through, you know, their own means and not utilizing being a veteran as a crutch to their identity, right? But I think those are the organizations I love, 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 love investing in. And I have the honor of being part of so many of them. Um, but by doing so, you know, I'm starting to see our industry fuse into that space as well. And tying that to innovation is somewhere where I spent a lot of my time as well. So there's like organizations like CSFI um, that I sit on the board for now that is really amazing. I, I don't I don't do anything with Cybercity yet, but I just learned about them this last year. There's some great ama- amazing folks that that work on empowering women and 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 minorities into the world of cyber, right? I mean, I can't, it's it's amazing. Um, you know, I, I obviously do a lot with the Travis Manning Foundation, uh, and then, I mean, all of that. So, I mean, I, I can go in so many different directions, but it's not just to do be part of that. Like, I need that. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I I literally need it, right, for me to keep doing it. It's, it's part of the reason, like, I didn't realize I needed it until I mistakenly enlisted in the Marine Corps. And I was like, man, it is really cool to be part of this community and this culture that we embrace and we empower each other. Um, you know, I joke, I not jokingly, like, you know, here at Microsoft, I call 
um, my business, this ready room, where no matter what rank you are, no matter who you are, what you do, you know, you you all sit there and, you know, you have you have your coffee cups and you walk around and, you know, everyone everyone's peers with each other. You can you can you can poke at each other. You can you can um, challenge each other without fear that you're positioning yourself. And that's the type of call you need to empower each other. Uh, and that's what I see in like nonprofits and others. They're empowering each other to do more good. So that's those are the kind of things I love to get involved with outside of cyber. No, and you, is- you mentioned it. Oh, oh, go ahead. So I was going to say, so you mentioned like it was hard for you and to delineate the professional and the personal. And um, I mean, I've seen that since starting like to work with you, bringing in some military mottos, aviate, navigate, communicate, um, <laughs> or we however have a, the order supposed to go. We have another one we add to that when we're not being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I did want to ask, so like, you, I love that you do blend that. You bring, you know, there's a there, there can be a large disconnect between civilians in the military space or the veteran space. And, you know, I think the work that we've done in Travis Manion Foundation has also done a lot to bridge that gap. Um, and I love that you brought that in, you know, to work because not a lot of people don't necessarily do that unless you do work with a lot of people who have served, do serve um, along those lines. But if you can, I would love for you to talk about, you know, you mentioned in a sense, this nonprofit work, but then how you've been able to use your professional to help innovate with the nonprofit world. Sure, um, yeah. Because, you know, you and I have talked about this a lot, obviously, with like what this project is, but in a sense, also, it's like a form of like a position of data breach. Like they are, you know, they have these vast, you know, Rolodexes of veterans or even just people in general it doesn't even have to be a veteran service organization but so i would love for you to talk about that project a little bit i mean i won't go off the deep end on it but the 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 premise of it is we have enterprise organizations around the world that are being attacked constantly by nation state actors right microsoft for example is the number two most attacked um organization in the world behind the united states federal government um and then you have organizations like 51C3s, like uh, Wind Warrior Project, or even like the Travis Manning Foundation, or you have, um, uh, you know, the World Bank, right? Uh, or you have uh, the Red Cross. And, and, and these organizations have sensitive data, have health data, have all these things with people that are vulnerable, that, have, that, that are seeking um, not help or assistance, but are, are, are seeking that partnership with these organizations to to invest in their mission or to benefit from, be a beneficiary of their mission. And that data, like imagine imagine um, living in a third world country and indifferent of uh, uh, religious, uh, uh, whatever your faith is or if, 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 if you believe or not, imagine living in a third world country and you're Christian. And, and, it, and the country is not a Christian, you know, accepting country but you're there and you can't leave but if someone finds out that you were there then your life is in danger right and imagine and imagine if you're part of those organizations like the international justice mission right that that protect and um empower individuals that that are doing that and that data gets compromised Right. That's you're not a you're not a Microsoft. You're not a you're not a um, Mm -hmm. Amazon or Google or any of these or I mean, any of these enterprise companies. Right. Disney or any of them. Right. You're you don't you're not one of those where you can just go renew your enterprise agreement and put your stuff into the cloud and um, put put boundaries around everything all of a sudden. So what if we created a platform of data? where we can at least educate and empower people to understand what their risks are and if they are at jeopardy of being at risk. Very simple, right? Um, And put them in their own little box going like, you are your own community. These are the risks. This is what's happening. These are nation state actors going after your types of data right now. We see it, right? Like when we saw the attacks 
Um, when we saw the attacks in Ukraine before the tanks rolled in from Russia, we saw them at Redmond the day prior, right? What if we were able to do that for nonprofits? And I think that's 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 the baseline. And I know um, I've had the privilege of working with Justice Bellhog and his team over at Microsoft Tech for Social Impact. And I spoke about this at the Bush Institute this last year and some of the work that I did through that of let's let's make this agnostic of cloud, agnostic of technology, and let's talk about the threat and the mission. And let's empower the people doing the mission to not take advantage of this, but give them access to it if they have the means to do it. Um, and that's doing more good, right? That's, you know, we have a business at Microsoft that that does not fall under our revenue categories, and it's called Microsoft Philanthropies. I mean, it's a great example how, and we're not the only ones. There's a lot of large organizations just like ours that do this. Uh, but I mean, that's, that's for me, that is public-private sector partnership. That's doing mm -hmm. more good for the world. Uh, and as corny as that sounds to most most people, like it's part of filling my bucket up because I, because you see it, like you're part of these organizations, you invest in them, like they're no less important than this person over here. Um, mm -hmm. They may not have the enterprise, but you also see like when I look at nonprofits, there's like one IT person for every 250 people in the nonprofit, and and they're also the 5K race director, <laughs> you know? Right. And, yeah, and they're that's also so the true. database well, person. Well, and right? if you think about it. They start their business, they start their 501c3 with the mission or the product in Very mind. Exactly. Like, right. ran it, like when you think about mom and pop shops, right, who make things for the Department of Defense and the cyber regulations that they now have to follow, but they're like, we just make this thing in our garage. Um, you know, businesses and these are built with a mission in mind and security comes second or last. Can you imagine like infusing like chat GPT into your business functions if you're a nonprofit, if you're like multi-rolled and multitask, and then like automating donors and 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 being able to enable people more to do less so you're not mm -hmm. having to hire someone just to put together a 5k and you can do more, right? Like that we talked about AI earlier, like it's the same thing. And now and all this chat GPT and AI piece, you know, this happened after like I started investing time in this side of the house, on that side of the house. Like this infuses it more, this makes it better for them you know makes it more better yeah. is that a, is that a term more better more I better today yeah <laughs> but you and i can continue down this rabbit hole i know we're we're getting into our favorite our second this is, yeah third this favorite, has been excellent one of our favorite and, can i just like pause in the conversation that i don't know if i've ever thanked you for your service but god damn it thank you for your service not just in uniform but especially out of uniform because holy shit, you make an impact like no other person that I have ever come across. Well, I'm very honored and and you know privileged to have people around me and to give me the opportunity to do that. And I and thank you. Like I'm, I always I, I I always say though that it's you know I'm only I'm only able to do it because of the people around me, right? Like my wife, my kids, even even them, right? Even my my team here at Microsoft and and others um a lot of folks don't understand they're making the impact that they're making and i just have i just get the opportunity to to be the voice sometimes so but thank you for thank you for that it, it means it means a lot especially from both of you because both of you have done so much um in our community as well so it's it's, it's uh very it is interesting possible. i feel like i am in a place in my life and i think that you guys can probably relate to this where like by the grace of God, I, and through you know, my opportunities with Microsoft and like all leading up to this, that I no longer have to worry about the basics, putting food on the table, keeping a roof over our head. And that's when, and it, so Dave Ramsey preaches this and all his stuff and like growing into a place where you can like do philanthropy and give back. And I never really understood it because I was always so busy grinding, just to figure out like where, where's the next meal coming from? Like, how are we going to pay rent? Um, but when you do finally arrive at a place where you can give back, the, this is a pinnacle. I mean, we're like leaving this world that we create for our children. We are going to leave it in a better place than we found it, you know, again, by the grace of God. But there's there's no greater joy for me um, yeah. than giving back. And I, that's, you know, what what I do is such a small scale compared to what the two of you two, you, you are extremely active. And so 
But um, here's the thing. Here's my counter to that. And it's something because, I mean, thank you for lumping me into the group with Vishal because. Well, that's how you far, met us through volunteer work. No, it'd be tough not to. Not, <laughs> but I always say, like, I just want to be a ripple. I'm, I'm not going to see. Like, if it's in just something, like, if it's in the small things, if it's, you know, if I find out that I, like, you know, I impacted somebody, fantastic. But if I impact somebody, like, 10 years, 15 years down the line, they remember something I said or an interaction with me, that's great. But, like, like you said, it's all about leaving where we are, who we interact with better than we met them. And that's all we can do. Some of us have great big platforms and big voices like Vishal. Um, and but I love that because there's so much that I've learned and I know you, you know, outside of work, and I've learned so much more about you today. Um yeah. so That's so true. We have such gracious role models within our immediate vicinity. We I, I certainly do not take it for granted. I've been in the opposite situation where I had real people. And my immediate circle that I was like supposed to be following instructions from. And this is like the antithesis of that. I feel like we've kind of arrived at the pinnacle of people who um, put doing good for others at the top of their list. And I'm just so honored to be part of it. Amazing. We're going to pivot now. We're going to take that intense <laughs> conversation. Intense moment. We're going to pivot into our favorite part of the show, which uh -oh. is rapid fire questions oh, and we kind of craft pew, these pew, questions pew. as we go throughout yeah. the show because sometimes you address things in like the course of your um you know monologue or whatever that we it was going to be like just a lighthearted rapid fire question and we have to kind of pull it out like oh no he said some serious stuff about that so we try to keep these light but you know thought provoking as well so I have a few and then Carly has a few so are you ready and these are quick answers don't like yeah don't, 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 don't overthink it pause and gave a very philosophical I've never answer. done this okay they're All good right. they're, it's fun um okay first rapid fire question how many times have you taken the DOD cyber awareness challenge twice <laughs> what in 21 years yes Fail. Move on. Fail. Move so. on. You failed that question. It wasn't around. It wasn't around. I, mean, I probably uh, took other ones, but like I think it's been it around came, since at least 2012. Friend. I've taken everything. I mean, I've always been able to <laughs> that stuff, but I mean, I don't think it was called Cyber Awareness Challenge. I don't know. That was a good question, though. I mean, I. Where I never... Tina pops over the cubicle and she's like, "Hey, we're doing some file sharing on the internet. Hey, <laughs> you want to participate?" Hey, buddy, let me just steal your computer. Every, anyway, I found this CD on good. this desk. Do you want to put it in? Do you want to play it? it? Okay, so I've done, I mean, I've done that every year. I've done it every year. I mean, I have to. <sighs> yes, that's the correct answer, is at least 21 times. Shave off, <laughs> more or less, whatever. <laughs> good question. Good question. You, got, you threw me off. <laughs> I stumped you. Okay, if you won the lottery tomorrow, where would we find you? Right here. Still grinding? Literally, you'd find me in my garage, right here. I, <laughs> if I, yeah, you know, I, I still, still here, still in, still in my role. I mean, I mean, it's easy to say. I probably have a lot more surfboards behind me, and I probably have, you know, it'd be a bigger know, garage too. I probably feel like. be a bigger garage, <laughs> insulated garage, you know, maybe. I, you know, I it'd might. be an air conditioner running in the background, one of those portable yeah. ones. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> But no, I, I honestly like my, my favorite place to be is the ocean, you know, and uh, and and so I mean, it, it's that's it. Um, you might I might disappear for a little bit to try to figure out what to do with a lot of that, but uh, <laughs> fair. But you know, there's a lot there's a lot of stuff you could. I mean, you said quick answers, but I mean, I mean I've got all the all the first generation American here, a lot of family, so like there's a lot of things that would probably happen. But where would you physically find me? Probably right here. Do you hear that car? Kind of no. alarm in the back. Do you hear the, uh, uh, what has he got? Uh, leaf blower. Leaf, my husband is doing I don't hear I don't hear yard it. work. Do you hear the leaf blower? There's been a lawnmower and then a weed eater and then another type of lawnmower. And now we're arrived at the leaf blower, which means I don't hear anything. It's great. Soon I can have a cocktail at my back patio. Um, okay. Elon or Bill, who are you betting on this year? 
Oh. <laughs> it's like you don't say, want it to be Elon. a political I, answer. I'm gonna say Elon. It... I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Elon. Yeah, me too. I I you know I I don't have to agree with everything, but I love what comes yeah. out of the actions. He's like a real cowboy. Love what, in Texas, out, get it? love what comes I love what comes from like all the action discussions around it. Like it, it, it's like it's like dropping a plunk into the water and then like being able to see where the ripples end up. So yeah, I'll go with Elon. There. Awesome. All right. Uh Top Gun one or two? One. Hands down. Such a right. such a that was old an easy person one. answer. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, followed by followed by Days of Thunder. You know, fall by you know, oh, yeah. cocktail, fall by yeah. oh, risky business. All right, it's Tom Cruise. But there's original like, before that, he jumped on the couch. He could do over the top. Yeah. With Sylvester Stallone, you know. There we go. That is Mitch's favorite movie. And I didn't even know about it. And then we were married for like five years and I found out right. this tidbit of information from him. And so every so often I'll go along to the table and just be like, Yeah. You ready? <laughs> Over time. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. Okay. All right. So with that, as the original, have you ever recreated the beach volleyball scene? Yes. <laughs> Naturally, I knew that answer too. How many surfboards do you have? Twenty-one. Twenty-one. Yes. One for every year of service. Uh, one. Uh, one for everywhere that I've surfed around the world as well. Oh, that's right. I do remember you telling nice. me that. Including deployments where I snuck the boards into cargo planes and brought them back home naturally uh what's your top character strength uh perseverance all right and final one would you let your kid use chat gpt to write their paper <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> i would i would but i'd probably try i probably you know build some things in to like proofread it and like but yeah. there would be some things around it like, but i, I mean, make you know, him proofread it and, and improve it <laughs> The proofreading is key. If they can figure the out proofreading is in the pudding. But no, they can figure out how to do it. If they can figure out how to do it and get it past me, like I mean, there is a whole other conversation to have, have there. You know. I think it's smart. I'm a thousand percent gonna use my chat GPT to write my connect. I mean, let my kid use chat GPT to do his homework. <laughs> All right. This has been so much fun. Vishal, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and thank you for listening to Cocktails and Socktails, the podcast where we make cyber relevant to everyone and unlock the stories of our leading industry professionals. And thanks again to the real maverick, Vishal, or should I say the real VJ? Is that the last call sign you had? I think we can end on that one, right? We well, we well, go into the yeah, call. we don't have to go. Okay. Well, thank, you uh, for having, thank you for having me. This has been so well, much now, fun. And thanks for sharing your experience and thoughts about cyber and life. Um, Vishal, if you want, do you want to share where people can find you? Sure. Um, I'm very findable on LinkedIn. Uh, so please find me there. Uh, you know, my first name dot last name and at, at my, you know, at the Microsoft uh, company there. So please reach out. And I think um, I'm looking forward to, you know, watching this. Uh, podcast you know when the when this comes out as well so i'm sure i'm sure we'll we'll see that on the socials as well yeah so we'll put that info and more details about the show in the notes below you can find megan and i here at cocktails and socktails on youtube every wednesday make sure to subscribe to this channel like the video and hit the notification bell so you never miss a beat cheers we'll see you next time cheers cheers, cheers.